Well, good afternoon. I am grateful that you are joining us for another episode of Truth Worth Living. We are emanating live from beautiful Clearwater, Florida today, right here at Skycrest Community Church. And when I say beautiful, I mean it's beautiful. I woke up this morning, looked at the weather across the U.S. and, and realized what a blessing it is to be in a place where we're going to enjoy 79 degree highs today. So I'm excited about uh, living here. I'm excited about God's blessings. And I'm really excited about Truth Worth Living today because, as you know, what we're trying to do is seek to understand God's Word so we can live in God's will. Now, for 17 episodes, yes, that's right, 17 episodes, we have been working through the book of James, which is like James is from the showman state, right? It's, you say you have faith, show me. Let's prove it. And last week, we talked about James working through juxtaposing worldly wisdom versus godly wisdom. And, and worldly wisdom is principally a system that manipulates things to our own advantage. We, we are, when we're living by worldly wisdom, we're looking out for number one, because number one, that's me. I'm the most important thing. So if James opened chapter four by just obliterating the hope of peace through worldly wisdom, he says that if you really want to look for the cause of chaos in your life, start right there. But start with the system, the way you're thinking, and recognize that most of your relational problems come from worldly wisdom. It's, uh, that's the heart of the issue. It creates problems in, in two areas. First, it creates problems between you and God. Uh, as James pointed out, it really messes up our prayer lives. If, if you're praying in worldly wisdom or to get what you want, then your prayers are manipulative and self-serving, and therefore they are unanswerable. So it creates problems with us with God, and it creates problems for us relationally. The envy and selfish ambition, which are two hallmarks of worldly wisdom, that stuff leads to fights and quarrels that derail everything else. So James sums up the issue succinctly in chapter 4, beginning in verse 4. Listen to verse 4. You are the first people. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy with God. So worldly wisdom is friendship with the world. And, and it's not people who drift into friendship with the world that Jennings is taking issue with. It's people who choose it. He says that if you choose friendship with the world, you are choosing to become an enemy of God. In verse 5, he essentially says this, if, if you have a struggle with the concept of becoming an enemy of God, how can we be enemies with a God who loves? Or, or you wonder, what is it that makes a person an enemy of God? Then just think back to what makes people your enemy. How do you become enemies with others? Look at verse 5. He says, Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? The, the envy or the jealousy that makes you struggle with other people is a distortion of the way things are supposed to be. It is upside down envy. It is unrighteous envy. And where does it come from? It, it's, it's your own self-obsession. Okay, it's your attempt to keep yourself in the center of the universe. But understand there is a righteous envy that God manifests. It, it's aroused when the covenant between God and his people is threatened or broken. When, as James said, we become adulterous toward him. So the Spirit of God living in us when we place our faith in Jesus righteously longs for covenant commitment, okay? That, that is, for us to faithfully keep God in the center of our lives by following him. Now, when we break that commitment or that covenant, 
his righteous jealousy is awakened, and he works to restore order, doing everything he can to take back what is rightfully his. Therefore, James is saying that friendship with the world puts us in an adversarial position with God. We, we struggle relationally, and his righteous jealousy then spurs him on to do whatever he can to restore relational order with us. Now, not surprisingly, he doesn't respond as we do. It's not about quarrels and fights. He responds with, well, let's take a look. How does he do it? Look at verse 6. But he gives us more grace. That's why scripture says God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Now, I I don't know about you, but I've never encountered anyone who's dealing with jealousy or envy toward me, or if I'm dealing with jealousy or envy toward them, that I choose more grace. This is Eddie. God responds. God responds with grace. But actually, it's not just grace. It says he responds with more grace. Now, now that begs the question, is, is God then giving us more grace than he gives other people? That, that seems implausible because James has spent a significant portion of this letter telling us not to play favorites because God does it. So it, it can't be that God gives us more grace and shows us us more favor because we're his favorites. Okay, that, that can't be right. But it is undeniable that there is an element of God giving more grace or more favor to some people and other people don't get any more. I, I, I think we can take more grace in two ways. All right, first, he gives us more grace, as in additional grace on top of the grace that he's already extended to us in Christ Jesus. Okay, we began our relationship with God by his grace through our faith, and when we fall into friendship with the world, there is more grace to come. He, he doesn't write us off because we've fallen on. It's, it's another wave of his amazing grace. And, and oh, how sweet the sound. Second, he gives more grace to those who are humbled by their error. And here's the big difference. And do you remember in verse 4, he's talking to anyone who chooses friendship with the world. Now, some people who are enemies of God, they choose that position. They resist any and everything about God and what they consider to be his meddling ways. They, they don't want to prioritize God. They've made their choice, and they welcome the chaos that comes with worldly wisdom. You, you've heard people say, if you play stupid games, you get stupid prizes. Well, rejecting God's wisdom for worldly wisdom falls into that category. You've made your choice, displacing God from the center and replacing him with your own agenda. And so guess what? God respects that choice, gives us the freedom to choose, and he isn't going to force more grace upon us. Why? Because in that position, the person in pride has said, look, I know best. I have a better idea about how my life should go than God has. My idea is better than his. I can achieve my dreams and reach my goals without him. And so in arrogance, I'm rejecting any further grace from God, and I'm just going my way. Well, Scripture says God opposes that person in response to them opposing him. They have made their choice. But... To the person who is humbled by their error, to the person who wakes up and says, well, I'm living as a friend of the world. I'm choosing worldly wisdom. To that person who recognizes that friendship with the world is enmity with God, and they humbly repent, there's more grace. There's no end of grace. He gives us more. So... The question is, what do we do? How do we position ourselves for more grace? Well, 
Look at James chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. And I'm just going to read these verses and we're going to close out because this is crystal clear. There are 10 commands in these three verses. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you setters, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Greed, mourn, and well, change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. So ten things you can do to live in the wisdom of God and experience more grace. It begins with submitting to God, and it ends with humbling yourselves before the Lord. Why? Because God lifts up. The humble. He opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, let, let me challenge you as you go this week to meditate on those commands because they represent truth worth living. Thank you so much for joining me today. I, I look forward to seeing you all Sunday morning, or you can come tomorrow night as we continue to study the book of Mark. So God bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, and give you peace. Have a great day.